Yes, my name is Rikke Simonsen. I work at the Copenhagen Museum. And I'm in country. Um, I'm going to talk about the Glasgow's of Christian IV. And that means having a closer look at the fortification he built through his lifetime. Uh, this paper is not based on many years of research, but um, more on an interest in getting a better understanding and a better insight into the fortifications of the 1600s in Denmark and uh, what the strategy was of fortifying the country. So this is only the first step. Um, <coughs> and uh, I will begin um, first introducing you to Christian IV. He's one of the most popular kings in Denmark. Uh, he seemed to be very much uh, Enjoy life, he was very rich, had several wives and many children. He treasured food and drinking, science and music, and he was very engaged in developing the country and had an ambition to make Denmark an important nation of trade. He also built a lot of wonderful castles and other buildings, buildings that are still highly treasured today. So he was a true Renaissance king. In 1596, um, when he was 19 years old, he was crowned king of Denmark and Norway. The country looked a little different then. This is the Danish border today. And this was the borders around the 1600s. At that time, the kingdom also included uh, a part of today's Sweden, an island of Estonia, and of course, Norway. And apart from that, Christian IV was also the Duke of um, Sweden and Holstein, south of Denmark. If we zoom in, you can uh, see it a little better. His father died when he was 11, and until he was 19, Denmark and Norway was ruled by a regency council. But uh, Sleesby Holstein, he took over when he was already when he was 16. And what does a 16-year-old boy do when he gets his first country? <laughs> he does a fortified a fortified city. Um, here you see the medieval layout of the city Krempe. And as I have already re revealed in the title, if you haven't guessed, Britain report is rebuilding it in accordance to the modern fortification system with bastions. So you could say, but this is the first day in the town, uh, town with uh, a lot of bad night fortification. The kingdom, Christian IV took over, uh, was very medieval regarding everything and not least the fortification. His father had introduced the Bastion fortification in Denmark, but only two places, uh, Kronborg and Radberg. Already before the coronation of Christian IV, the Regency Council had started modernizing two fortresses in Norway and one in Scania. Um, yeah, please note here that the yellow dots are the new places I introduced, and the red dots are the old places that I introduced uh, on an earlier slide. But when Christian IV became king, he continued the work on these fortresses and also started working on other fortifications. And this is where he chose to set in before 1611. So you see the yellow dots uh, are the new places and the red dots the old ones. These fortifications serve as a counterbalance to the strong Swedish fortresses of Kalmar, Neuschwil, and Edsborg. And um, another thing he did, already the year he was crowned king, was to build a large harbor in Copenhagen, just in front of the castle. Um, and it was meant as a naval base for his warships. Here the ships would go in, get equipped with guns and ammunition, 
from the largest arsenal in Northern Europe that he was also building as part of the harbor, along with a huge storage house where the ships would get food supplies. And this does, of course, reflect the importance of the navy. The kingdom, then like Norway, was held together by the sea. As you know, water doesn't separate the things together. And often in conflict, Denmark has also relied on warships to help out and uh, act as a kind of mobile fortification. Another aspect is, of course, that the ships going to, to the Baltic Sea through the Sound had to pay toll to the king. So it was important to secure these uh, waterways. In 1611, a war broke out between Denmark and Sweden. And even if the country was uh, mainly about northern Norway, most of the battle took place uh, around the southern Swedish border. After the war, the focus of the fortification work was changing. Four completely new fortified cities were built in strategic places. And existing places like Helsingør and Skanderborg Castle were fortified. Other places were planned to be fortified, fortified, but probably not so much was being done before a new war started in 1625. This was known as the Emperor War in Denmark, where Christian IV takes up the fight against the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor in the Thirty Years' War. And now we're going to get a little complicated. Uh, the pink dots are the plans that never happened. <laughs> um, but what we see here on this map is the time before the Emperor War. And as you can see, there was a strong focus on the defense on the south and the Swedish border. When the Emperor War began, there was only one modernized fortification to defend Jutland, Scandinavian uh, and Castle. And even the, the war was taking place far away from Jutland, somewhere in Germany, but uh, still. Things were, however, also speeded up now. New fortifications were built, and it was considered, <coughs> and it was considered also to fortify these places. But the work didn't start, um, or only very little was done before the German general Wallenstein and his army forced their way to Holstein and Schleswig and occupied Germany. When the war ended and the peace treaty was signed in 1629, Denmark did, however, get to keep Germany. If you compare this map uh, to the earlier ones, the fortifications are more spread out, which is an improvement, but still I think you can almost sense the panic behind the location of these sites. It doesn't like, look like a well thought through plan to uh, protect the kingdom. And if we look at the next phase of fortification works, uh, that was initiated after the Emperor War, the strategy seemed to be more or less the same. Filling in holes so the country could be all round secured. Um, that was, of course, a hard uh, lesson learned from the Emperor War, but probably also due to the fact that the Swedes had moved into Germany. Here they are at uh, Frankfurt. Um, the Danish enemy number one, Sweden, was now also capable of attacking from the south. And that was, of course, what they did. In 1643, the Swedish general Torstensson attacked from Germany and occupied Jutland. And shortly after, Scania was also attacked. During this war, new fortifications were made in between the occupied areas. The war ended in 1645, and as we saw, Denmark got a little smaller. We lost Halle and the islands of Samar and Gotland, and also a part of Norway. So after the war was reflection, and at last a thorough plan of defense for the country was made. Just to mention two important points of this plan. The fortifications should make up an interconnected system, 
and it was a necessity that they could all be rescued by the Navy. So the new defense plan was based on cooperation between the Army and the Navy. The other thing was that the connection across the country had to be secured with fortresses into strategic places. This plan did constitute a basis for the fortification strategy in the next 100 years. Christian IV um, never got to say this plan though, as he died soon after. Um, and let's end by having a look at what he achieved throughout the years. The map reflects that in his lifetime he had built 49 fortifications and he had planned another um, 11. I realize you can discuss the, the, the definitions, but uh, I think it makes sense uh, right now um, from the perspective of this presentation. The fortifications include different types, nine smaller forts, like Christian's uh, which is the equivalent of 18%, Along, all, almost all the smaller forts are from the years between the Emperor War and the Torpen Sea War. Thirteen big fortresses, like uh, Christian's Priest, equivalent of 27%, and a little more than half the fortresses are medieval fortifications that are modernized, and the other half, and the other half are new fortresses that are being built under or after the Emperor War. Then we have the fortified cities, 27, equivalent of 55%. And they include both new planned fortified cities like Castings and stuff, uh, and old medieval cities that were, uh, that were fortified. The strength of the fortification differed. Of course, they were planned differently. Some were meant to be very strong, whereas others had only light entrenchments. But not all became what they were meant to be. Some fortifications were never finished, or the building process took so many years that the fortification was old-fashioned before it was completed. There are several reasons for this. The work on a fortification is start of very slow, for instance, um, if the military focus changed, the threat suddenly appeared somewhere else or simply disappeared. Many fortifications um, were never completed due to the wars and put an end to several of the plans. A lot of the works lacked people and money. It seemed to be a weakness that not all of the projects were planned carefully enough. It wasn't taken into consideration if there was money and meant to actually get the job done. The fact that Christian IV actually had built uh, 49 fortifications was a surprise to me. Uh, a lot more than I had thought when I, I chose the subject. Um, and I think it's very likely that more and these smaller forts were built and plans made that are not included here. Today, Christian IV is praised and admired for the wonderful castles he built, but I think his fortification work was a much bigger achievement. Uh, he was king in the period of time of the Renaissance idea about fortification in Scandinavia and he was, as we have seen, implementing these ideas on a large scale. So it's actually more or less a revolution within defense we have just witnessed. In Denmark, there's not uh, much awareness of fortifications of Christian IV, and I don't think that this revolution uh, is very well known or recognized part of his legacy. And probably there are two reasons for this. Um, one, that there are not so many fortifications within Denmark anymore, the Danish area has become somewhat smaller, and we lost the fortresses that were in the border areas. And secondly, many fortifications are gone because the development of artillery was so fast that the fortress very quickly got outdated. And when we have old-fashioned, outdated bastions, then they will either be demolished or decay, or they will get modernized by another game. We can take Copenhagen as an example. This is Copenhagen with the medieval walls and towers. 
This fortification was modernized by President Ford, as you can see here. Um, when he died, it was already old fashioned. And his son, Frederick like III, rebuilt it into a larger and more modern fortification. So today, you know, not only in Copenhagen, but around the country, only little, if anything, are left and visible from the bastions of Christian people. Thank you.